Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and many thanks for joining us today for this webinar entitled Health Systems, Culture and Climate Change. My name is Dr. Amali Lokigamage. I'm an obstetrician and gynaecologist and a decolonial medical educator. This event is the final webinar in a series entitled Physical, Mental and Planetary Health, exploring the links between environment and health, which is jointly organized by Flourishing Diversity, the Wellcome Center for Cultures and Environments of Health at the University of Exeter, and the Wellcome Center for Ethics and Humanities at the University of Oxford. Planetary sustainability has put us all into an uncomfortable liminal space where there's an urgent need to develop new ways of thinking and to navigate the complexities and uncertainties of the Anthropocene. The biomedical paradigm characterized by the separation of the human from nature, of mind from body and of us from them is encrusted with the jewels of Euro-American exploitation. Its legacy, one of many, has to permit critical thinking to be infused with the domination of scientific knowledge over indigenous knowledge, of expert experience over patient experience, and of Western knowledge over knowledge from other regions. The decolonization and dismantling of the historically biased, epistemically rigid and hierarchical thinking that has sort of led us to the brink of environmental collapse must recenter a more nomadic or rhizomic type of thinking that works against the grain of traditional Western categories and conventional methods. We need to make breathing space for experiential, person-centered, ecological wisdom to blossom. So what might this look like for global health and academia? In this webinar, we feature decolonizing innovators from all walks of life, postulating the concept of deep medicine, rhizomatic thinking, ways of dismantling colonial epistemologies. We have Rupa Maria, a US physician, Crispin Chetwin, an artist, and the co-founding editors of Decolonial Subversions, which is a publishing platform, Romina Istratli and Monica Hermer, and myself, a decolonizing medical educator. We will have time for questions at the end, so can you add any questions that you may have into the chat? And, uh, and please note, we have a five minute break halfway through this conversation so that we can kind of regroup ourselves. So I'm going to start by inviting one speaker at a time to introduce themselves and sort of explain how they got to this space of decolonial innovation and what they see as the problems um, that are there, how, do they think that these problems could be uprooted, having a sort of horticultural metaphor there? And um, I'm going to start with Rupa Maria. Please can you um, please can you introduce yourself and explain how you came to this sort of positionality? Thank you, Amali, and good morning, everybody. It is five o'clock in the morning where I'm where I am, and I'm very happy to be here. I'll be um, continuing to caffeinate myself to get the brain started. Um, my name is Rupa. Um, I was born and raised here in occupied unceded Ramatush Ohlone territory, which is now called Mountain View or the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area on the peninsula. Um, this is where I was born. This is where my grandfather died. This is where my sons came to the earth. Um, and I'm very grateful to be here today. Um, I was born to Punjabi immigrants who were here because of the colonial realities in our homelands. Um, and I um, was always a person who <laughs> um, didn't want to define myself as a scientist or an artist. Um, I kept being required as I went through my studies of defining, well, are you going to be a doctor or an artist? Which one? And that, that question always filled me with terror because I didn't understand how to reduce myself um, into a singular identity. So I am a composer. I've toured around the world with a band called Rupa and the April Fishes. Um, we've traveled in 29 countries over the last 15 years, uh, produced a lot of albums, and I would use my music as a way to investigate dynamics of how um, social structures were impacting people's health. 
Um, and if I went with a clipboard and my stethoscope probably wouldn't have had the kinds of experiences I did when I went with my guitar and my ragtag group of um, uh, musicians. And so when we'd go to these communities around the world and share our music, um, it would open the door to all sorts of conversations. But I really got interested, um, you know, going in between, and I should say my whole experience as a physician artist, I, I majored in political theater and molecular biology. I ended up um, going through my residency training as a part-time on a path for people having babies. Um, and they said they couldn't discriminate about who used this path. So I'm like, oh, great. So my, my songs will be babies. Um, and so then I went, you know, two months in the hospital, two months on the road. And I did that um, two month, two month thing um, throughout residency. And then on to my training, they invited me at UCSF to continue this path. So it was 15 years of really beautiful um, inquiry of um, sound and experience and what I was noticing. Um, but it was really when people in my community started being shot by police um, for the crime of being black and brown in a neighborhood where, you know, the wealthy tech elite wanted to take over and now it's thankfully leaving. Um, and people are decrying the collapse of San Francisco. It's just turned into this terrible place. Um, not understanding their the impact of their presence um, in making like throwing everyone on the street so that they could have our homes. And when I saw how um, dynamics of economics and politics were causing people I knew to be shot in the streets by police, you know, um, that's where I started to ramp up my intersection at like the intersection of um, my role as a physician activist and artist. Um, I started, they started to intersect directly. And I started to understand the body as a place of um, almost like a map of, of what the ills we were seeing as, as, you know, as, as doctors in the hospital, what I was witnessing. So I continue to practice um, medicine. I'm going to the hospital in a couple hours. Um, I, I practice in the hospital a few days a month. Um, I now work directly in farming and returning land to Ohlone people and um, and creating a food system locally that is based in recombining. Um, and so I'm very grateful to be here and honored to be in the presence of so many um, people who are at the active edge of thinking of how to reclaim the commons. We can't hear you, Amali. Yeah, everyone's on mute. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, sorry. It's these funny screens. I'm having multiple screens today. Um, that's just a wonderful introduction, Rupa. I'd like to now introduce Crispin Chetwind, uh, an artist. Hi, I'm Crispin. Um, thank you, Rupa. That was really uh, amazing. Um, I'm trying to find some credentials here, but I, um, I, I, my academic uh, area was a long time ago, and I did uh, work on. I joined up uh, mm -hmm. Nicholas Boriard from Alta Modern. He was a um, writer who found trying to find a way out of the postmodern uh, predicament, and um, this was in 2009 or something or earlier. And I did my dissertation on uh, him and Deleuze and Guattari's rhizome from a thousand introduction to a thousand plateaus. And I just found it really interesting, the metaphor of rhizome and um, arboric or nomadic versus hierarchic. So the, the, the cities are trying to take over the desert and the desert's equally trying to take over the city. And it's a, uh, territorialization and deterritorialization situation going on and it although I don't practice uh a, much philosophy at the moment we moved to Wales all my books are in boxes still three years later and um but that that um dialogue has kind of stuck with me and uh Amali I I wrote up this uh thing on this performance my sister did at a, a medical conference and the earlier conference was a, a lady who 
uh, was doing historic thing about uh, ethnic uh, women being uh, uh, experimented on in the 1800s or whatever, I'm not sure. And the audience sort of took that on as being normal, like they could process that because it's what they were used to. And my sister came in and did a pasta <coughs> necklace making workshop. And you had to take the necklaces up to her mother who had a kind of crow's face on. And um, she would either smash it on the ground because it was rubbish or hand it back to you saying, well done. And <laughs> in the end, uh, the, the, the people in the audience, the faculty, <laughs> whoever, they were just so outraged. And it's kind of blew my mind a bit. And Amali had put this thing together for this very purpose. So it took a few days, but we realized that actually it had uh, done exactly what it said on the tin. It, it disrupted the um, uh, medical uh, board or whoever. And um, anyway, that, that was left for a few years. And it was just like last year or something that Amali had dragged this response of mine out of a cupboard or something and said hey this is really like interesting and can I publish it and I said you can do what you like with it I, I don't I don't want, you know I don't want anything to do with it mainly I didn't want to do the um uh referencing because I had I just written it as a as a you know just as a throwaway really but um but I'm glad she did because it's brought me back into my uh you know that that uh subject and I do know a lot about it, and uh, it constantly comes up, you know, in recently uh, mycelium has been uh, uh, taken as a kind of platform of, it's a growing like a brain, it talks to the trees, it's, it's, it's uh, I, so I'm just constantly fascinated by, um, by that subject, so it, it does come up a lot. I don't know, you know, how that yeah, it's difficult right now because I also have planted in every single area on this land that I live on and I my time is every day is a learning day I'm 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 shredded I we had a two alpaca babies yesterday I was shearing alpacas the day before I'm digging up weeds today and <laughs> I'm exhausted. I, you know, so this is like, I've never done a Zoom uh, chat before. So th this is, I, I purposefully made no attempt to uh, revise this morning. I tried to relax and just see where it went. So that's where I'm at. That's great, Crispin. I have to say that we, uh, it was a, it's actually a paper by another great decolonizing doctor called Idioma Nodin Opara, who wrote a paper called It's Time to Decolonize the Decolonizing Movement, which is all about how the decolonizing movement is trying to shoehorn people into the very structures of, of hierarchical thought. And, uh, and that's where Crispin's um, uh, sort of extract from his thesis about um, hierarchical versus nomadic thinking and and its context within decolonization became um, uh, pertinent. And uh, our other co-author who unfortunately couldn't be here today, Matthew Harris, is, uh, is, in, is an academic in global health and his book in decolonizing health innovation is just about to come out. Um, so just a plug for him. And uh, we work together to put uh, this paper, which is in the chat now, uh, which is called Biomedical Research, Global Sustainability, Throwing Off the Straight Jacket of Hierarchical Thinking, Making Space for Nomadic Thinking. And that ties in with what I said at the introduction. So now I'm going to move on to Romina. Thank you so much, Amali. Thank you for having me. I don't say it humbly, but uh, I can think of, I don't know, at least 50 more people who can speak better than I can to these issues, but I, I was honored for you to, you know, for inviting us and uh, we've worked together, uh, you know, in, in having your paper published. Uh, and I think you're doing such important work. So, you know, it's, it's an honor to be here and, and thank you for giving us this space uh, and bringing us all together. Um, I, I don't know where to begin. I think I'll, I, I share very much sort of a, a journey, a personal journey that as, as Rupa shared. 
uh, quite different, but you know, it's it's very existential for me too, um, what I do and how I arrive to it. Uh, I was born in Moldova at the end of the Soviet Union and my, my family and I migrated to Greece. Uh, I stayed behind, I then reunited with my family a few years later. Um, and um, I think that shaped, shaped me uh, and my early experiences. And I always wanted to go to the United States and study. Uh, you know, we, we were a low income family. You know, we left our country. We didn't have anything. We sort of had to start anew. Um, and I had this impression that, you know, the center of excellent knowledge was in the United States for some reason. Uh, and this is me coming from a former Soviet Republic. So I don't know where that idea came, you know, kind of originated. Um, but I worked very hard to, to get to the United States, which I did with a scholarship, and I, I obtained a liberal arts education. Um, and that was, you know, I think with fondness back to the liberal arts education, I think it's more critical than other institutions uh, in the way it approaches the world. And I was quite lucky with uh, being where I was. Um, but I also came across this dominance of an Anglo-American perspective on the world. And I started working because I had to work as a student on a scholarship and I was doing research in economics and agricultural economics. And at the time, the paradigm of conservation agriculture, Kristen might be familiar with it, um, was emerging and also in, in, in juxtaposition with the gender and development paradigm. So it was this paradigm about, you know, all, all societies in Africa are unequal, we need to pay attention to women, you know, there's gender inequalities, um, you know, so, and it was a very monolithic representation of these societies. And then I, I noticed that the same monolithic representations were being applied to Eastern and Central Europe. And let's not forget that the region of Eastern Europe is an enlightenment uh, you know, uh, invention of Western Europe. So, so I kind of started to reconnect to my own origins and thinking, well, I come from the periphery and kind of realized that there is a problem with the science and, and the representations that we are being given in, in, the, in the literature. So, um, I went on a peregrination of Africa for, of four different African countries, which were very much diverse. Um, I competed for a fellowship to be able to fund this. Um, and I went for a year in four different African countries to sort of speak to farmers, men and women, to hear their own realities and their own uh, voices and perspectives. And I think I went over uh, through 60 villages at the time. I was 21 years old, a bit crazy. And I said, you know what? I need to discover what's going on in the world on my own. Um, and, and of course, I mean, I only saw, you know, a tiny bit, but, but everyone was so, uh, how can I say, welcoming and, and real and, 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 you know, realities were so much more nuanced and co complex um, and not monolithic than, than what was being presented. And then, you know, I sort of had a crisis. I said, I'm not going back to education. I locked myself in a room for a year and I read a book. I can't remember. It was by a Japanese author and how to grow plants in the desert. Cause I was, you know, I, I was determined to go back to the desert and grow plants. Kristen, that might talk, speak to what you were saying. Um, but I did come back because I thought, look, uh, I'm in this position. I've been blessed to be able to understand what can I do with myself to subvert the system. You know, that was kind of what can I what can I add? You know, I'm, I'm tiny, <laughs> infinitesimal. How can I make a difference? Um, and I've been sort of dedicating myself, uh, my life, and my work since to sort of de-westernize and diversify representations of, uh, in particular, African real gender realities, because that's what I started with. And, and um, working with communities in community-centered ways, you know, learning the languages, um, sort of very uh, self-reflexive approaches. I don't want to call them decolonial because I think, you know, it's always work in progress. So I don't want to claim that they're decolonial, but we're trying. Um, to, to really uh, find solutions to community problems that, uh, you know, generated by the communities themselves. Um, so a de-westernized, diversified response uh, to development challenges, to societal challenges, to gender issues like domestic violence, which is what I, I currently work on. Um, and in parallel, I had, this is just on the, on the, on the side, um, I worked as a research funding officer at SOAS, University of London, while I was a PhD and after graduating. And I, you know, I had a feeling that, you know, this dominance of a single culture or epistemology was underpinned by many other factors. And I wanted to work as a research funding officer because I wanted to see how funding structures and inequalities uh, and other sort of normative and structural uh, parameters contribute to this epistemological dominance. And that was really enlightening. And it allowed me to work with funders and really understand, um, you know, the whole system that maintains their status quo and this 
single, you know, this dominance. And so I work in all these dimensions now in a nutshell to try and make a difference. Um, but, you know, uh, it's, it's very small. So I, I can I can say more afterwards. It's very challenging. Thank you again for having me, uh, Amalia. I hope that that gives a bit of context to start with. Um, excellent. Thank you, Romina. And now on to Monica. You have to unmute yourself, though. <laughs> Yes, apologies. <laughs> hello, Amali, and hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me also on this, uh, yeah, wonderful, uh, with these wonderful people speaking about issues that are very close to all of us, I guess. Um, so, yeah, my name is Monika Hirma, and I'm currently um, a teaching fellow in subjects revolving around uh, religion, politics, decolonization, and uh, philosophy at SOAS. University of London, which is also where I have completed my PhD. And yeah, my research lies at the intersection of anthropology and philosophy and centers more specifically around uh, contemporary South Asian goddess traditions, where I look in particular uh, at the everyday life and existential coordinates within Sri Vidya cosmology, which is one of the uh, tantric traditions. Um, yeah, before coming to this research, before coming to source in 2015, I, I lived in India for nine years. And I became deeply enmeshed uh, within the local culture and modes of being. And there were two recurring aspects that were both disturbing and immensely eye-opening, which then led to my commitment to decolonization and what I'm doing today. Um, so firstly, in India, I became acutely aware of my privilege as a white person, uh, where during the everyday life, whether it was uh, queuing at the post office, uh, getting a rickshaw or even a doctor's appointment. Um, many of these everyday situations were just much easier for me than for people native to Hyderabad, which is where I was living. Um, and basically, yeah, what was underlying this, this privilege that I, that I was being given was my skin color and the uh, subconscious and mistaken association of whiteness with superiority and wealth and power and authority, all um, hang-ups of centuries of right. yeah, brutal um, colonial oppression and brainwashing. So once I came back uh, to, to Europe and to the UK, I was then confronted with realities that are profoundly shaped by neoliberal values and also by individuals who compete against each other. Um, people and actually also beings at large here, I feel are no longer seen in and on their own terms, but more like um, potential money makers, you know, and means through which to achieve larger and bigger uh, and more prestigious gains. So I became aware that life in the Western context does not no longer revolve pri primarily around um, care, nurturing, and harmony within and also beyond one's own species. Uh, but again, yeah, around money and growth. <laughs> and these are ultimately um, the same values that drove the exploitation of colonies, right? So uh, with the difference that we have nowadays um, totally embodied these values to the extent that they inform also our most intimate and everyday experiences throughout. And so these two experiences, primarily these two aspects of my years in India and then back in, in the West, have ignited this, this desire to be part of a change towards an existence that is again informed by care, nurturing and respect, uh, extended uh, beyond one's community. Uh, across cultures and species, and ultimately also to the environment and the cosmos at large. And just to conclude, I would just um, say that I, I don't call myself a decolonial innovator, because what I came to appreciate over uh, these years um, is that decolonial living is a living based on care and respect, right? 
And that these values are actually ingrained in us from our youngest, um, earliest moments, as we can see in the relationship between a mother or a teacher or a guru and their children and students. So I don't really think we need to innovate so much as instead relearn, yeah? and uh, listen to our bodies and be receptive of inter interconnections with others and with the environment and become attuned to this more harmonious living. And yeah, crucially, I see people from non-Western regions leading the way in this. Um, and therefore, yeah, rather than an innovator, I would see myself more as someone who supports this rediscovery. Um, of already existing decolonial modes of being. And uh, yeah, through means such as creating with Romina this publishing platform where we can give voice to marginalized people. Yeah. Thank you so much, Monica. Uh, that was uh, wonderful to hear how you came to this space. Um, I suppose I'd better say something about myself now. So uh, I was born in Sri Lanka and emigrated to the UK when I was one. And I would say uh, from the sort of cultural background that I have in Sri Lanka that we are very much enculturated into a colonial attitude. And so I launched myself into a kind of medical career, um, always aspiring to become a scientist uh, of um, my sort of research doctorate was about a drug that kind of contracted the womb and made sure the baby was ejected out and it was only later in life when I became I think uh, I think the point was when I became a mother I realized that oxytocin the hormone that ejects the baby out I just thought it was a mechanical thing but then I realized it was a hormone of love connection um, and uh, just just, uh, just compassion it's one of the chemical mediators of all of those qualities that Monica just actually outlined. I thought, whoa, this is so strange. We haven't been taught about this in medical school at all. We haven't thought, been told of these dimensions. And for instance, how important it is to receive nurturing in early life uh, and how that affects one's um, ability to show love and connect with the planet, um, mother nature. Uh, and it's all, you know, mothering has a huge part in that. So that's why I'm very interested in Monica's ideas of, you know, goddess cultures from, from the East. Um, and then uh, I came into a space of realizing that birth and the knowledge that was delivered was strangely biased. Um, and uh, I, 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 I meandered into human rights and childbirth of of suddenly understanding that why women didn't want to birth in the medical system. Um, and, uh, and that was a revelation indeed. And then from sort of human rights to healthcare to diversity and inclusion. And then I held an event at the medical school um, on practically creating a, 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 an inclusive curriculum. And one of the anthropology students said, why don't you do something about decolonizing the curriculum. And at that point, I really didn't know the term at all. And I turned to my colleagues and said, what is decolonizing? And someone said, oh, I think it's something about bowel bacteria and colonization. <laughs> so it was that stage of uh, real unknowing. But then ever since then, it really has unraveled at top speed in understanding that the whole structure and way in which I was taught and proceeded in academia was uh, puppeteered by a structure that came in during colonial times. And that's when that was the start of biomedicine. And in that, the ejection of folk healers or women um, in terms of being midwives were all moved aside because of this sort of domination of, of a very kind of um, uh, Eurocentric, um, and then later US and Eurocentric attitude to health that was dominated by uh, uh, predominantly white males uh, at that time was hugely classist, um, sexist, ableist, uh, and many other, um, other prejudices that kind of got um, percolated into the whole structure of delivering knowledge and of society. And so much so that we're sort of blind to it. 
Um, and from that, and coming from that colonial structure of my Sri Lankan origins, I suddenly realized that there are actually a lot of people who are, who are from colonizer countries that have also got enculturated into that. And it's quite interesting. I mean, this point I'm making is that if you look at the cry for diversity at the top levels of power, say in the UK, we realize that actually there are lots of, there have been black and brown representations, but enacting, reenacting colonial mindsets from their, well, I don't know, I postulate, I, I don't know for certain, their educational backgrounds and the way in which the hidden curriculum which is kind of the, the, these unnamed, undefined biases that get transmitted very subtly through education, give rise to the mindset of society. And so that's how I sort of came to this space. And also, I suppose, from my Asian background, always as I grew up and with my trips back to Sri Lanka to visit relatives, there was always this other stream of the way in which you heal. There was the biomedical, you, you know, if you get a fever, you give paracetamol, suppress the fever, and, um, and maybe you might need antibiotics. And then this other stream of Ayurvedic knowledge of, oh, actually, if fever's good, uh, we give you Ayurvedic herbs to make the snot or the mucus run more, so it drains rather than reducing the temperature, um, actually makes all the mucus uh, more stuck inside the body and that I was very conscious of these different paradigms and the fact that this that there wasn't much medical pluralism around and in fact it was ever more truncated in terms of um, science and scientific thought and so that's how I really came to this space um, and then through medical education using public engagement uh, and then realizing that the the key to disrupting these very entrenched um, power hierarchies in medicine and in society is to descend to the power by including, uh, well, in, in the medical scenario, the, the patient's voice, um, the women and birthing person's voice, um, basically the recipients of care. And in, in other vistas, it, it would be, again, that inclusion of the voice of the people served and that is disrupting because you don't know what they're going to say. It's, it's that rhizomatic response where you don't know what their value systems, their ideas, their ideas of solutions uh, will be. And, uh, and that is quite an unsettling space actually for biomedical people. I imagine not just biomedical, but arts and humanities people who have been used to delivering education or services in a particular type of structure so that's why I saw Crispin's um, the, the thesis is really important about um, rhizomatic versus hierarchical thinking and art as a disruptor because I, I found it in my practice a huge disruptor and uh, and then the also the other thing that I found really important is that um, it's, very, it's a very colonizer attitude to need a solution. We need to come up with a solution. We need to think our way through the problem and come up with a solution. But actually it's all of this sort of hierarchical thinking that's got us into this sticky place of the Anthropocene of man's damaging effect on the biosphere of the non-reciprocal relationship with nature. And so we've got to have a space for just new ways of thinking. And when you have produced new ways of thinking, there's, there's a whole toing and froing, re-territorialization, territorialization, Crispin alluded to it. And it's all right to not know the answer for a while. It's all right to actually writhe around and think, oh, it's very uncomfortable. I'm not quite sure what to do. It's actually very good for you to do that. Um, so anyway, that's how I came to this space. Uh, I am conscious, though, that um, Crispin didn't quite, could have elaborated on Deleuze and Guattari, and Rupa could have elaborated more on her concept of deep medicine. Um, we've, we've got about um, 10 minutes until a break. I was just wondering whether you could um, perhaps, Rupa, go into your concept of deep medicine. Sure. Uh, thank you so much. What a beautiful 
group of people. I wish we were in the same space well, together. Um, I can't wait to be one day, um, maybe down on a farm, um, learning how to compost or sitting and looking at the <laughs> at the uh, mycorrhizal fungi in the soil. Um, and sorry to not say that in the proper Greek way, but maybe you can teach us. Uh, Romina, um, but uh, deep medicine is a concept that Raj Patel and I um, really expounded in our book, Inflamed, where we looked at how the, um, the health of our bodies, the societies we live in, and the planet itself are um, inflamed um, because of the ways of thinking that we have been inherited um, through Western colonial capitalist arrangements of power. Um, and um, as a physician, you know, we don't learn that people are the rising rates of diabetes, rising rates of heart disease, cancer, all the things I see on a day to day basis as a hospital medicine doctor. We don't learn that those things are actually being generated by the exposures that people have um, on a day to day basis, accumulative exposures. Um, and by exposures, I mean the ways in which society and the environment have been constructed through dynamics of power over the last 600 years, um, leading to the destruction of ecosystems, leading to air pollution, leading to um, the violating of rights, um, the over-policing of Black, especially Black bodies here in, in the United States, but Black and Brown people, Indigenous peoples around the world. Um, and so... Um, for us, deep medicine is um, taking the term from deep ecology. So instead of centering the human eco ecosystems as making sense or being beneficial to humans, that it's beneficial unto itself, that things are thriving um, beyond, above and beyond their human centric qualities. We see deep medicine as the thriving or the, um, the health of systems. Um, and then that requires moving outside of the concept of the individual for where health is located um, or where disease and pathology is located into the structures and systems around us. So deep medicine is working at the level of the systems to um, enact the possibility of health. Um, and so that has been actually a very helpful framing for me act in practice as well as a physician and makes me understand that the work that I do in the hospital with when I'm working and engaging on an individual level with a patient that is coming from, um, whose illness is impacted by these structures of oppression, um, that political education and, and offering an understanding of why somebody is sick um, that is above and beyond the logic of the individual is actually quite healing. Um, and this is part of the work of the Black Panthers Party um, and the ways in which they confronted, let's say, the opiate um, use disorder with acupuncture, massage, um, access, um, acts of care. Um, this is also the Young Lords combined with political education so that people are understanding, you know, why are we in this state? Why are we sick in this way? Um, and it and it does um, definitely subvert the biomedical reductionist model, because when you look at the burden of chronic inflammatory disease, which is the diseases of Western industrialized societies, these diseases, um, it is more your, your some of your lifetime exposures is more predictive of the onset of these diseases than your gen genome. But what we're taught in Western medicine is that, you know, you have a genetic predisposition to this. Oh, lupus, you have a genetic predisposition to this. Um, and we're not taught that actually this person's coming from a set of exposures that will make, the, is, uh, make it unbelievably impossible to avoid. So when we're thinking about diabetes and your, you know, your physician is talking to you about diet and exercise, and that's all they're talking about, they're not talking about getting involved in dismantling the structures of capitalism, um, it becomes a form of medical gaslighting where you're situating the responsibility of the illness on the person, as opposed to on the structures um, that are actually driving the illnesses um, and, and at the same time, the destruction of the earth. 
um, when, I, when I think of deep medicine, it also involves, um, you know, planetary health. And Chris, when you were talking about territoriality, and I haven't written a song since the pandemic started. I don't tend to write music when I'm grieving, and I'm actively grieving the loss of millions of people from the earth right now. Um, as everyone has moved on um, from the pandemic, um, one of my patients just got exposed to COVID from their roommate in the same room in the hospital. And the woman came in yesterday in the emergency room and she says, oh, I have back pain and I'm short of breath. And I turned out to be COVID positive. And I said, yes, those are symptoms of COVID. Those, and, she, and, and she said, I have COVID? Like, this is COVID? And so there was this, there's this disconnect um, with the narratives that we're telling about the pandemic, about the virus, um, and the actual experience, the lived experience and the experience of the virus itself. Um, but I was thinking about um, not writing music for a while and wondering, okay, I'm grieving, I'm not writing music. In California, where I live, um, there is a lake that is reasserting herself right now. Um, it was called Lake Tulare. She has an ancient name. Um, it's the largest freshwater lake west of the Mississippi that was drained by colonizers um, once they extirpated the beaver, killed off the wildlife murdered the indigenous people and relocated them. They drained this basin. And this, this central California um, valley is like the Serengeti. It's a huge flood basin. It's an amazing wetland, but it's all been drained and the topsoils have been abused by the chemical warfare of industrial agriculture as we make almonds and pistachios for the world. Um, and, um, and with this record rains we've had and snowpack in the Sierra, this lake, has come back and um, it has been the most inspiring thing for me to see a lake come back. And I told my kids, I'm like, let's go there and just watch the snow melt. Like that's, that's like the most exciting thing to me um, because we're seeing the water reclaim herself and um, sink these toxic farms, flushing the land and reasserting herself. So right now, and the snow hasn't even melted, it's 233% the snowpack that we usually get. Um, the, right now, the lake is um, larger than the size of one of our largest lakes, Lake Tahoe, and the snow hasn't even really started to melt. So it's a, it's a glorious, beautiful experience as an artist, thinker, person, um, to understand that's the deep medicine of the earth acting upon her own self. Um, reclaiming herself. That's land back right there. Um, she's just taking it back. Um, and it's and it's been a beautiful thing to start to hear melodies and start to hear the um, richness of that um, story of this water coming back. Um, it's been very inspiring. I don't know if I answered thank, your thank, question. Thank, thank, but... thank, thank you, Rufa. I've got a few questions, but we're going into a five minute break uh, very shortly. But uh, I suppose just a, a kind of a sneak peek. The questions I wanted to ask of uh, Crispin was more on uh, rhizomatic versus arboreic thought and about art in the space of science. And I wanted to ask Monica a bit more about the inclusion of medical pluralism and uh, ecological health, as it were, from those uh, health traditions that want to balance the body rather than control the body. And I wanted to ask Romina about uh, cre the creation of this platform, Decolonial Subversions, which is it has many, many types of um, object placed within it and how and about uh, uh sort of dismantling epistemology but i think we'll come back to that after the break um so i think we'll have five minutes break which will take us to about 13 51 uh just for a comfort break now is that okay everyone all right thank you we'll be back
I think we should begin in order to give people some time to ask questions. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome back. Hope you're refreshed and rested. Um, so I'm going to ask um, those questions that I kind of floated before the break. Um, so uh, Crispin, could you kind of delve a bit more deeply into art disrupting biomedical spaces or even ecological spaces or, or, or just academic spaces and how that can benefit and, and any kind of parallels between the rhizome and arboric um, knowledge um, dismantling? I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> you have to bear with me. Um, so at university, they said that uh, Nicholas Boriard, what he was saying was that there's no point, or in fact, the whole university was saying is that there's no point in reproducing old artworks. It's been done before. And the postmodern dilemma is that everything's been done. Um, so how do you move on? How do you? How do you uh, progress. And Nicholas Boriard uh, uh, used the rhizome as a sort of metaphor. He said, uh, you have to act like a DJ and um, present work, uh, take what there is, what's already been, and present it in a, a different way. Um, <clears throat> and what was interesting with the performance my sister did, was that it dis disrupt, it did disrupt. Should, 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 we, should we just name her? Wants to chat when, yes. at the moment. But anyway, she, um, and uh, what what they're saying in the art sense to get out of postmodern condition is, is um, uh, how, to move, how to move on. And that could be applied, you know, to anything really. So it, 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 um, the trouble with uh, Nicholas Boria, Dan Deleuze and Qatari is that they're, they're, well, they're actually three white Western Hemisphere males, but also they're French philosophers, notoriously complex. So really difficult to talk about because <laughs> the way that they write is in such a way that you can't, unless you're really fluent in it, you can't really regurgitate it too easily. But because uh, I, I tell people about arboric and um, rhizomatic and they don't, they've never really heard of either thing. And they're both as a metaphor. So the, the tree is like a family tree, if you like. It stems out and it's a hierarchical system with roots that go into the ground. And a rhizome will diversify and spread and move in any direction. And <laughs> with a rhizome, um, something comes up unexpectedly from the middle, like the milieu they, they talk about. And, um, uh, you know, there's so many, there's so much to sort of talk about, it's really difficult to try and push it into this uh, space. But uh, like, um, I want to say the orchid and the wasp, but that's quite a long story in itself. And it's just, um, it's just that the, the, the Orchid, what the orchid and the wasp. The orchid wasp looks at the orchid and it sees it as a female reproduction system. So it territorializes and deterritorializes, and it's doing a job, but it's not. It's unexpected. So what? And someone else said, I don't know. When we were putting the paper together, someone said, um, uh, "Embrace uncertainty." And the trouble with like trying to. Uh, 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 disrupt hierarchical systems is that um, you know they're going to stamp on it. There's a lot of fear. They don't want it to happen. They <laughs> they want to hold on to what they got. Um, but you know it's not about destroying it because you don't want your doctor to be taught rhizomically. Really, you want them to be taught in a structured way. But uh, to have people come in, and I think it's a social like uh, this sort of thing, like a Zoom meeting, bringing people together um, is rhizomic in a, in a way because it's um, a social interaction, um, not 
with any real, uh, per I, I don't know, you know, it's just sort of messy. But um, what, what it does is then you can, um, yeah. people who, who get involved with that, but let's say young nurses or doctors or somebody, they, yeah. if they have a social platform that's working, uh, they can take responsibility in a different way. They can hold up, they can, um, you know, take an interest and a responsibility from a non uh, hierarchical structure. And by doing that, yeah, they then they go on to be taught in a structured way that they already have a, a grounding in how to move, you know, how to move on. So all it is, is just, it's a, it's, it's a way to sort of, um, change how uh, things are done I suppose yeah I don't know yeah. I, find, I mean it's it's really it, Amari, I can't tell you I could read it and then talk about it but it's like complex stuff it, it, it is complex and it is that the kind of rhythmatic thought allows complexes to unravel and that's why for instance I have looked into cultural safety which is an idea that stems from a um a Maori nurse educator as um and 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 part of uh, cultural safety is to include the voice of the people we serve uh and for the people in the system to reflect on their power uh, and their positionality and the power of the patient and all of those systems and it involves co-production. Um, and I, I suppose that's uh, in my way from a medical point of view, that's a way of introducing that kind of uh, somewhat anarchic, but unpredictable uh, input where we need to sit and uh, re-visualize and perhaps iterate, go through an iterative process uh, and just be, uh, uh, okay with not knowing for a moment in time and let's see what evolves because what has evolved so far from the structure is the Anthropocene and so we just need, need we we need a new tact uh, but we don't need a new tact that jumps off from the colonial thinking um, and perhaps the rhizome is the way but let me just move on to um, let me look at the time. Um, let me look, move on to Monica and um, and what you might say to recentering other ways of thinking and other ways of being um, from your perspective. Okay, I'm unmuted. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I will take. Um, uh, yeah, the cue from my um, work in anthropology and philosophy uh, to then elaborate slightly on this. Um, yeah, so first, when it comes to anthropology, um, many of us may know that its origins um, are very questionable now because it, uh, as the study of uh, cultures, it often used to study rituals and customs of uh, predominantly non-European people. And with this knowledge, then uh, explorers could uh, understand and then conquer and rule uh, non-Western people okay. with much more efficacy and all of this. So of course, like this aspect of anthropology has luckily changed um, since its origins. And nowadays, in many ways, I feel that anthropology is a discipline that can really help us to, um, in an ethical way, also um, interact with other, with, with um, not only with other humans, but with everything around. Because there is no longer this uh, assumption that categories of meaning can be translated in a one-to-one uh, -one relationship across cultures. But there is this understanding that we need to also really look at the processes that underpin the formulation of categories of knowledge. And um, so, for example, questions that we can ask then, are, um, what notions of the body 
underpin, for example, the idea that is prevalent in, in the West or in a medicalized uh, society that only females can become mothers, right? And then on the other side, vice versa, we can also look at what types of bodily notions inform instead the idea that motherhood is not only tied to a specific gender. And this is what I um, could observe in like where I was working and living um, in a temple in South India that motherhood, the concept of motherhood, was not only restricted to a biological paradigm, but uh, also men uh, and also women without children, biologically speaking, were addressed as amma, as mother. So we do see that the scientific positivistic paradigm is just one of many, right? So when we start at um, contextualizing and seeing the arbitrariness of certain narratives, that's when I think we can also start to look at the um, processes, yeah, that underpin and the modes of being that underpin different worldviews and thus gain an understanding and uh, interaction. So, um, yeah, and this type of my experience there uh, helped me also to really see this, the, the again, the ethics of care, because everything in a way was revolving around motherhood. And so a whole new paradigm of knowledge and of existence was um, introduced to me, which was around care and respect and nurturing. And um, one thing that's underlying all of this is the acknowledgement of one's enmeshment with the environment. Um, what is important is not so much where one comes from, one's blood descent or one's geographical region, but rather the relationships that one establishes continuously and that are generated and regenerated in the present. So this allows then to give precedence to relationships with people, with non-human animals and with the environment and the cosmos at large. And I think that this, in a way, also helps us to really overcome the Anthropocene, which, in my, idea, in my opinion, is really um, the center of uh, where so many maladies of the current world come from. This understanding that we are what we generate and co-generate with existence at large. And so we can bring about, again, uh, a non-anthropocentric and harmonious, respectful uh, way of living. Um, I just want to just, I don't know if this seems a bit abstract, but maybe I can bring one little example from uh, my field work, which I think is quite uh, enlightening <laughs> on to show how uh, relational modes of being where the human is not central um, can come to the fore. And so, for yeah, I was working in this temple, which was revolved, which revolves around Tripura Sundari, who is a uh, benevolent, erotic, and motherly goddess. And there was a girl, maybe five or six years old, who came to visit with her father, and she saw me working there. And so she saw my skin color and asked whether I was so pale because maybe I was a chicken whose feathers had been pulled out, you know. And then she was concerned if I was hurting. Like, so while this may seem uh, childish or naive, actually what we see here is that when I was a chicken or a human was secondary to the fact that I was hurting, you know? Um, and my skin color was also really secondary to other questions. And this type of care and concern is there also in the adults, in the priests and priestesses with whom I was living. Um, so for example, even for them, it was not, what is important is not the blood descent, but, or, or the area where, we come, where one comes from, but the relationships. And these extend, these relationships of love and care extend beyond humans and include also the goddess in this case, but also, for example, the stray cats and dogs who were roaming around. And these were, first of all, beings who may need some food, some shelter or some company, or if they happen to have puppies, then they were in the first instance mothers and only in the second instance cats and dogs. So this non-anthropocentric worldview and mode of being, it's not abstract. It can, we can um, actually 
it, put it into practice. And so, yeah, again, it's not that we have to innovate so much. We have to just be more careful at listening and looking to other paradigms, other narratives. We have to be welcoming what the environment and the cosmos and the goddess and other animals and other humans as well are telling us. So, yeah, I, I want to just keep in mind this positive note so that, because otherwise, yeah, in an anthropocentric and capitalist world, I think it's it's all quite dark, but um, I have been lucky enough to see non-anthropocentric and to live in a non-anthropocentric sphere. So I, uh, I take inspiration from that in what I'm doing. I think you're muted, Amali. Uh, I think you're still muted. Okay, thank you very much, Monica. That was just very, uh, very fascinating. Um, I am going to go on to Rubina, but uh, I just want to leave enough time in the end for a fruitful uh, discussion between audience and speaker. Uh, so, Romina, can I give you around about uh, five minutes to talk about uh, the academic platform of decolonial subversions? I mean, I was we were attracted because uh, Matthew Harris, the other co-author, we went through standard high-ranking medical journals to put out these kind of uh, dis dismantling thoughts mm -hmm. and they were just rejected saying that it doesn't fit into the, you know, this paper doesn't fit into the normal uh, ways in which you express yourself and and so forth. And, and so we landed rather well in publishing in your journal, but perhaps just, um, or platform, would we, would you say, perhaps you could just elaborate on that and also on uh, kind of dismantling, yeah, knowledge, dis uh, epistemologies through this avenue that you've set up. Happy to do that. Um, I mean, this is a, a vision that sort of Monica and I arrived to collaboratively, so we, we, we you know, we have uh, different perspectives we come to it from, but then we, I think, coalesce or <laughs> converge in, in the vision and the direction we want to see this take. Um, so I'm, I'm going to just mention that it started uh, with us, uh, you know, during our PhD years in, at SOAS because we felt uncomfortable with our disciplines, we felt uncomfortable with our knowledge being locked in specialized journals. Um, and we started editing the SOAS Journal of Postgraduate Research with, with Monica. and and that had you know it was so en enriching you know the anthropological research going on at the school of oriental and african studies despite you know uh the problematic origin of the institute you know the the, the stu study of languages and the study of uh, cultural systems and those were locked right and and the communities affected were interested in that research could not access it so monica and i made some changes already to, to the swell's journal postgraduate research making it open access uh sort of circulating it uh more broadly um making it more multilingual to the best of our capacity and that organically led to what de you know decolonial subversions the current platform uh which we wanted to really take to the next stage because Although we could do a lot with SJPR, um, it was still affiliated with, with SUAS. And both Monica and I are very um, keen to be independent and autonomous to the best of our ability. We're not, we're still within the system and we understand that and that has limitations. But we didn't want the platform, this network of international, this very international network of friends and colleagues we've met in Ethiopia myself during my own anthropological research and, and years of living there, uh, Monica in India, uh, various other countries in Africa, Asia, Latin America, Eastern Europe, we have about 15 countries represented. And these are all colleagues we know and we've worked with and who believe in the same vision. And so we didn't want it to be affiliated with any one institution that because we wanted everyone to own it, not it, not you know, to for it to be decentralized, to be a collective effort, not associated with any one of us. Um, and, and also to not become uh, restricted by, you know, the, um, the constraints that come with an institutional affiliation. And, uh, and those could be ideological, structural constraints and many other constraints. So we really fought hard. I mean, we thought very deeply of how to do this in a way that it could still remain unaffiliated to the best of our ability. And that creates challenges with funding, which we can come back to at the final question of how we, we dismantle the, the, the system. Um, but ultimately, this responds to a number of trends uh, and issues that we've seen in the current system, right? Uh, the dominance of Anglo-American epistemology, 
Um, this, this obsession with theory as a telos in itself uh, or a tendency I've seen and we've seen in academia to sort of ascribe to a paradigm and, and operate in trends and ideologies, um, you know, as if, as if one cannot have, you know, their own sort of independent thinking and needs to ascribe to a paradigm. Um, that's those sort of norms, those hidden unspoken norms within uh, research and knowledge production. Um, including research practices, the way we engage with communities, you know, extractionist practices, we've seen lack of reflexivity, but especially lack of self-awareness in research. So uh, everything we do at Decolonial Subversion is very much centered on the role of the researcher, of the contributor, of whoever is speaking, could be an activist, uh, could be a member of the public, to, to you know, we, we, we engage, we encourage everyone to, to be reflexive of who they are and where they speak from, and we don't um, hold this idea that um, you know anyone is a, a representative of any one community. Everyone speaks for themselves um, to to sort of validate you know every distinct voice um, that there is. Uh, another trend, of course, is the disproportionate uh, you know representation in global um, publications uh, of non-Western societies, indigenous societies, mar you know marginalized voices. Uh, so we wanted to create a platform where everyone could publish in in a form that they felt comfortable with, not just written uh, form, but also acoustic or a visual or art artistic or film or poetry, uh, you know, whatever they felt um, that um, they needed to express their lived experience, which is not necessarily discursive or, you know, expressed in writing as, as we might be used to in this in this epistemology. And we wanted to do it in a way that people could, could contribute to that platform and, and share their knowledge wherever they might be in the world. They, you know, so that they don't, they don't need to come to the center to learn English and, and write a book and, you know, uh, become credible as, as academics and then and then make an argument that people will listen to, right? We wanted to validate everyone's voices and knowledge and experiences wherever they are. Um, and, the, and, and not just academics, not just people who hold degrees, but anyone who has a live, lived experience uh, to, to share with, with the rest. Um, and of course, we also wanted to subvert the dominance of a single language because we understand very well that one's worldview is expressed through language. And, and when you obfuscate multilingualism and linguistic diversity, you obfuscate, obfuscate different worldviews uh, and concepts uh, that might not be expressed within English uh, and most likely are not as, as Monica's, I think, example showcased. Um, and of course, the, the, the material and uh, barriers that exist in publishing, and I refer, you know, not, not just to the previous paradigm uh, where, you know, one had to subscribe to a journal to be able to access specialized research and publications, but also even under the open access paradigm where you have very high article processing costs, APCs as we know them. And the assumption here is that a funder or an institution will cover those for the, for the researcher or the contributor or the author. Uh, but actually that entirely ignores that there is inequality across the world and not every institution in the world has the ability and the funds to cover you know ABCs um, and, and so you know we wanted to create something that is free uh, to use um, and, and overcomes the norms that we know make the current publishing and knowledge production publishing framework um, it's in any language that people prefer to contribute in that we can work with. Uh, we have to find reviewers in that language. We have to find translators or linguistic partners to help us with reviewing. Um, anything that we can do, we facilitate. We work on a case by case studies. I mean, it's really about being more having having a culture of care towards the contributors, not simply you know extracting that knowledge and pr and promoting and producing it for career building or, you know, for the platform to become, uh, you know, more established. That's not really the aim of it. The aim is to create a space where anyone can come to and feel welcome. And, and, and it's been challenging. It hasn't been always easy. I, I think Monica and I can, you know, can sort of start, can discuss that a bit, a bit further down um, this webinar, but um, it, it's been very important for us essentially to uh, start to subvert all these norms, including in peer review, uh, that tend to validate certain perspectives, certain formats of, you know, authorship more than others um, and make everyone welcome, but also in a way that that knowledge can be communicated and start subverting the Anglophone center. So this is why we put emphasis on 
trying to promote, uh, produce translations in English to the best of our ability, because we want the English speaking researchers and we want the, you know, the, the center uh, or uh, sort of the Anglophone center, if one, one could call it that, although it's not that simple, um, to engage with these peripheral, marginalized, minoritized, silenced knowledges and experiences, right? Because otherwise we are just create, we are just continuing the periphery center model. But what we hope to do is that um, there is this, uh, this, this dialogical knowledge production model, right? This uh, interactive model, if that makes sense, where the one influences the other. And then you have multiple centers of knowledge production across the world, right? Everyone can produce knowledge wherever they are and every locus of knowledge production matters the same, if that makes sense. And I think I'm going I'll... to interject, and that really um, is a good metaphor with Crispy and re-territorizing and territorizing and the milieu, not just the arboric structure or the rhizome, but both the milieu and something quite dynamic and creative emerging from that. Yeah, that's absolutely fascinating. Yeah, uh, that makes yeah. me think of. Mamali, that makes me think of the soil, right? So what you're yeah. speaking of, like the soil and the air. So how the rhizome, the mycorrhizal fungi are actually the, the bridge between yeah. the, the, the organisms. Um, yeah, I think that that's important. It's fascinating. I think we have to move on to questions. We've only got about 10 minutes for questions now. Uh, I'm gonna have to ask um, one of the organizers, Callum Smith, to actually funnel some of the questions because I've just looked in the chat box and there are some very, very long questions that would take me a while to read through and perhaps you've been keeping an eye on the questions. If you send them through to me, Callum, um, that would be good. Just There are all sorts of questions about um, other ways of thinking, even Western thinking. Um, You've all written such wonderful, complex questions. Um, let's see. Okay, there is one question here about cultural competence versus cultural safety. So I've got a, I've got a positionality on that. So I view cultural competence as a non-evidence-based format for trying to make things fairer for people, but it has some intrinsic problems in that it can stereotype certain cultures. It can, it doesn't examine power and reflexivity and doesn't really engage in co-production of knowledge. So that's why I think cultural safety, which does draw in all of those attributes is perhaps a more rhizomic way forward and not sort of from a center of knowledge deciding on the stereotype of the person and what we need to do in terms of equality, diversity and inclusion. Uh, so that's my answer to that question. I need to find a question for um, some of the other, here we are, hang on two seconds. Okay, I'm going to, uh, Laura has put in here, he's, she's extracted the question. This is to anyone really, uh, but I imagine um, it is part of the very work you're doing, Rupa. It's, have you explored alternative European health, medicine, nature, agricultural epistemologies and practice that could contribute to decolonizing strategy? Um, I stay away from personally, I stay away from anything that's got traces of Rudolf Steiner in it. I find it perverted personally. Um, so but I, but what about indigenous? Well, so yes, so there are practices from around the world um, of, of growing food and tending the wild um, that are ways that we, we and they're also extremely contextual. So they're not something that can be copy pasted around the world. They're, they're highly um, specific to the microbes in that soil, to the uh, food cultures of the places of the um, you know, peoples. But I do think that um, reawakening our local um, and also our, um, our personal relationship to how we grow food 
um, how we interact with soil, um, how we understand our um, location on this beautiful planet um, based on um, those, um, those the, again, relationality. I'm just really struck by what Monica said. It's in my mind um, because it is a, it's a relationship to a specific place specific um entities that are there so i'm you know walking around where i live and um, there's a great app called seek um, because this knowledge has been not transmitted to me um, where i can it's by the california academy of sciences you can just scan a plant and it will tell you who it is and it will tell you is it native or introduced um, what are the qualities of the plant um, all this information about um, the plant um, not any historical, you know, relationships with the plant, but but at least allowing you to identify who's there. Um, and that's something that I think is like a ground zero place of understanding what bioregion are you in? Um, where's your water coming from? Where's the watershed that you live in? Where are those waters coming from? Um, and then how are you in relationship to those entities, those plants, those animals? Um, when I go to Europe, I, I really feel the, the death of um, wildlife. I live in a place where there's mountain lions, where there's still, I hear coyotes at night, I hear the foxes, I hear the badgers. Um, there's all sorts of wildlife still here, even though the violence of European occupation has decimated so much. Um, but what is it like to live in a space that has been so like just so structured by the anthro anthropocentric worldview that that you don't have wild you don't have that wildness anymore and how do you and why wildness what do I mean I mean you don't have a space where humans are not centered and um, controlling of every aspect of things that make life happen um, and so um, yeah I think that the that it is important to explore the vast array of traditions of Europeans. Um, and when I say Europe, that's also like um, of, of indigenous tribal knowledges from around the world of how people grew food um, and how people nourish themselves over, uh, for, for, for thousands and thousands of years, for how people made it through the last ice age 11,000 years ago with the seeds that have been a part of all of our stewardship, that we actually, our ancestors, all of our ancestors par participated in stewarding those seeds forward. So how do we reclaim the commons of our seeds? Um, because those don't belong to any corporate entity. They belong to all of us. Um, so many humans around the world did that work and, and animals participated in the work of keeping those, um, those lines alive. Um, so I, I think that the work of um, reclaiming our tribal ancestral knowledges is critical and starting to dismantle and dissolve concepts even of European, like these monolith, monolithic identities, French, you know, these identities are again, part of the world global over um, um, economic order of nation state building for the same purposes as, you know, European conquest and colonization. And the concept of India, right? Like, what is that? I don't identify myself as Indian, I identify myself as Punjabi. I'm from a specific um, bioregion that has a specific history and a food history. So I find like the earth, um, when I think of food um, and the work of food creation, like food participation with the plants and animals and um, beings to create food, I think of the, that is the active um, interface between my living and the earth's living. That is the space where I become earth is through the ingestion of food. And so learning about the practices that kept people healthy and well where I am is a critical part of that um, reawakening for me, which means I'm spending a lot of time with um, native, California native folks who know, who still retain that knowledge and how can we help support them and the work that they do. Thank you very much. Um, there is, I think we've only got one uh, time for one question. I'll throw it open to everyone. It's just sort of, uh, we you talk, uh, Rupi, you alluded to farming practices. I suppose someone someone has alluded to. Are there any thoughts on the the planet, livestock production, chronic disease, malnutrition, um, just food production? Has anyone 
Would anyone like to answer that question? Yeah, I'll say that um, uh, <clears throat> uh, farming is, you know, like a in the West is like a hierarchical system anyway, genealogy, they uh, inbred, they've made cows produce more milk and, you know, production uh, economical. And in the East, it's, uh, you know, it could be nomadic where they're just taking a few cows and goats with them. Um, so the countryside gets chopped up into quadrants and, you know, it's all channeled into one direction to feed the masses. I mean, I'm, I'm a city boy. I lived in London 30 years. But no, I'm 61, 50 years. I don't know. I came here and it's quite wild. And, and you know, I am fighting, you know, as it's... Uh, the rhizome and the, and the arborica metaphors of plants. You know, I'm in the countryside here and it's a constant battle. You know, do I mow the lawn? Do I rewild or a tree falls down or um, <laughs> you're constantly fighting uh, nature. You know, it's, it's growing all the time, especially this time of year and um, <clears throat> making decisions about how to, uh, you know, what best to do, you know, is yeah, it's a, it's a big subject, but I just like to, I just wanted to bring in that, you know, it's still that um, uh, territorializing and deterritorializing of the land, you know, and um, yeah, that's what I have to say about uh, that. And there oh, is I... that, that is a tension, isn't it? Um, yeah, I'm... Amali, yes. can I just respond to that? Because I think that the way that I would see that, Crispin, is we're not fighting nature, we are nature. Um, and that's the thing when I look at here in this area, when Europeans arrived here and they're like, wow, it's so lush and so beautiful. Um, let's get rid of all these brown people. Um, they had nothing to do with it. But it was actually the people were actually the, the par participants and the agents, one of many agents, including the grizzly bear and the tule elk and the antelope, who were participating in the pruning of the forest, the, the removal of the trees the burning of the grasslands. Um, these were managed systems. They've always been managed systems. Um, and it wasn't till that mentality that, oh, that's nature and we're fighting her. Um, that's, we are nature. And that's when, that is really ultimately, I see as a, a really important um, way of knowing that is, is critical to undo. And, and it comes up in our language all the time because we've been so inculcated in this idea of um, being at war with ourselves. Um, that's great, and that hence inflamed, and the title of your book. Uh, that was wonderfully eloquently put, Rupa, and I think a flourishing diversity and uh, Exeter University and Oxford University uh, welcome centres have been addressing uh, that question in, in, in great detail in some of their other events and, um, and their webinars. So I would encourage people to definitely look at their archive. I'm gonna draw this meeting to an end and found it enormously enriching. I've got a couple of last minute uh, announcements. Um, so um, if you would like to watch the recordings of the previous webinars, please follow the link in the chat, okay? And the second thing is, um, the, th uh, the thing is, um, so to please help the sort of um, the shaping of future events, please could you follow, could, could, could you give some feedback? And then again, that, that is in the chat, the link. Uh, and so thank you all for coming. Um, it's been a tremendous session. I've enjoyed it in, in, um, enormously. And um, and thank you again for hosting this webinar, Flourishing Diversity, um, the Welcome Centre at Exeter and the Welcome Centre at Oxford. Thank you, Marley. Thank you for having us. Thank you to all the organising team and uh, the speakers. It was great learning. Thank you so much. And to the audience for your yes. patience. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yes, thank you to the audience. I'm sorry we couldn't answer all of your questions, but we have run out of time. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed it and I hope it sets up lots of uh, rhizomic activities that are going to span out in unpredictable directions, all for the benefit 
um, of, of planetary health. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>